Hey everyone and welcome to the 145th edition of D After 8 Weekly which is and indeed shall always remain our weekly show where we discuss the latest gaming and technology news. Doing this one in the uh, the aftermath of uh, CES, Consumer Electronics Show 2024, um, but perhaps bizarrely there's not actually much content from the show that we're going to be talking about, mm -hmm. um, but still much to discuss and joining me first of all John Linneman. Rich, uh Good to be back. It's been a good week. Lots of stuff happening. Good games, good displays, big TVs. It's all here. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Alex Patalia, hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Yeah, CES stuff. I'm excited to talk about that as well as a certain trailer for a certain game. So a certain trailer for a certain game. A certain trailer for a certain, certain trailer good, for good a certain game. Okay. Very specific of me. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're cool. getting very specific there. Uh, okay. Let's go. Uh, first new story of the week, uh, nothing really to do with CES, but rumours have emerged. I'm not quite sure the extent to which they've been officially confirmed yet, but um, key first party exclusives from Microsoft currently found uh, only on Xbox consoles and PC may well be migrating into the realms of multi-platform. And uh, previously, uh, Microsoft has had some success in porting titles to Nintendo Switch, uh, the Ori mm. games, Hellblade, uh, excellent ports, I'd say. But the concept that we're actually going to be seeing titles on uh, PlayStation uh, is very intriguing. Um, obviously, there is some precedence there in terms of Minecraft, but this is very definitely a, um, a shift of sorts. Um, John, what actually has been officially confirmed as of yet? Uh, are you um, aware of that? I don't believe anything's actually been confirmed. There's been some games rumored. I think Hi-Fi Rush has been mentioned. Yeah. Uh, sea of Thieves, I think, also got some mention somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it, but it's a, it's a delicate topic. But I think there there's definitely some things to discuss here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where do you want to begin? I mean, what, what do you make of it all, first of all? I mean, um, there are the Xbox diehards who aren't really happy about this at all because you know um they're worried about the future of the console why should xbox make consoles if they're essentially releasing all of their games on all available systems so i i actually can kind of understand where that's coming from uh based on the traditional model that consoles have operated in and this is obviously a big change and I've been kind of thinking about what that could mean for the future. What what does Xbox look like? And I do feel like perhaps Microsoft is slowly changing what Xbox is, you know, fundamentally. I think the rise of Game Pass is kind of part of this, perhaps. Uh, because, you know, if they're just playing the traditional put out your console, sell the boxed games kind of, kind of thing... Uh, they're not matching with Nintendo or Sony right now, right? Like in terms of raw numbers. But mm. Microsoft is a gigantic, very successful company and primarily a services-driven company that also does hardware. So it got me mm -hmm. kind of thinking about what could Xbox look like in the future if if this meant something. It's like, and I'm curious what you guys think of this idea. What if they had sort of like... I think they would should continue to sell Xbox consoles going forward and de deliver them. But if you look at what's happened with the portable PCs as of late, the rise of Steam Deck uh, and those types of competitors, many of which, well, all of which are pretty much designed to run Windows. Imagine a future where the Xbox is almost like a Steam OS like thing where it's essentially a version of Windows but it's got a very robust front end system that functions as well or similar to the Steam Deck. And then you also, so you sell, say, you can have portable PCs like that, but you also sell a console, which is also running this OS and behaves mm -hmm. much like that. And these games run just natively on your PC. And then the Xbox becomes this whole just like thing that exists, a marketplace, like a service where you're playing Xbox games, right? You can still buy your box, or you can buy a handheld PC. They could actually do both. Like imagine they get the Surface Group involved and you have a boxed console for your TV, but you also have something like a Steam Deck equivalent. Uh, you brand that right. You make it look really nice. You really beef up Windows to run this kind of stuff. They're also, I mean, they're becoming one of the biggest publishers in the entire gaming space right now. I mean, they've got a ton of developers under their roof. Uh, which also I think would tie into why they might want to sell on other platforms too. Right. right. Because like they, they want to make that money now that they've got, they've got all this power. I think that 
there's this misconception where it feels like they want to just make the their traditional console model the quote unquote king, right? But I think they they have a much deeper strategy than that, and one that is more focused, obviously, on making money, uh, which is something Microsoft <laughs> has traditionally uh, excelled in. I think we can all agree. Uh, so, like, I could see a future where they are still doing their tr- their more traditional console, maybe in a slightly different way, but they're selling their games on their own platforms, but then also offer certain games on other platforms as well, and basically mm. pulling in sales from wherever they can. I mean, if somebody's buying these games on a Switch or a PlayStation, Microsoft's still making money from that, right? Like, mm. and if you see the value of their services, like you see like, well, if I subscribe to this or if I have this box and I just get all these other games as well and I don't have to spend 70 bucks on that game. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it, this whole thing, it's, it's, I'm kind of talking in circles here, but I'm trying to imagine where they might be coming from with what it looks like. And I kind of feel like to really like, they could be looking towards sort of disrupting the market in their own way rather than just trying to chase the traditional model. Because I think Xbox is kind of moving away from that. I I don't like them moving away from say physical discs and whatnot, but I think that's what they want to do. And I think that if they do so, that opens the doors to approach just consoles and like where they put their software in a completely different way. And they kind of enter this different d- different zone uh, than Sony and Nintendo. Because, I mean, like, Nintendo without a console is what? Like, I feel like that's so central to their brand. Uh, I think Sony is a hardware company first that also sell- makes games and, and does the PlayStation and all that. And Microsoft is a software services company first and foremost that also happens to do hardware. So yeah. I kind of feel like they can leverage all that experience to create something new, find new success in these areas. Um, so I don't know. I that That's kind of a broader take on the situation. Maybe we can get into some of the individual things about these specific games, and maybe it doesn't mean any of this. Hmm. What yeah, do you guys think? Well, what do you guys think? <laughs> um, I think I'm agreeing with you 100% there, John. I mean, um, if you think about it, the... Um, Focus from Microsoft now is obviously on Games Pass um, <laughs> and subscribers there, right? Sure. And um, what does this mean? I mean, essentially what you want to have is um, as many monthly active users as possible. Now, you're not going to have an Xbox app on PlayStation or Switch consoles. No, I don't but I noticed so. actually, um, based on your Prince of Persia uh, uh, review that I watched yesterday, John, Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, conceivably, they could have an Xbox login. You know, Why not? You've got, new, you've got an Ubisoft so. Connect. You've got an Ubisoft Connect login on Prince of Persia. You've got the Bethesda logins. I mean, we've had Steam horrible. on. We don't uh, want the PlayStation, if I recall. <laughs> yeah, on that, PS3. That, but you you see where I'm heading there. You know, yeah, conceivably, yeah. those could be added as uh, monthly active users uh, to, to their ecosystem. They've got Call of Duty that's going to be doing some something along those lines, surely. You'd Achievements think. as well, by the way. Uh, there's no Ubisoft and all of them have their own, I think, list of that stuff. So you could technically be unlocking Xbox achievements yeah. alongside, you know, you do it on PC. Whatever, Why right? not? You do like, it on PC. Like I feel like that's <laughs> all possible. So if you have a scenario where games debut on on Xbox, PC, and Game Pass, and then you know a year later they're on the other consoles, what does that actually do strategically for Microsoft? What it does is you know, expose those games to a new audience and potentially recruit them into Game Pass for the sequels or whatever that come along. Um, It just makes a lot of sense. So it just sort of highlights that, hey, I've just paid money for these games, but, you know, on Game Pass, I could actually subscribe per month and get the new releases for quote unquote free, really Mm -hmm. the subscription cost. And it's basically an evangelization system. But it yeah. does also mean, you know, that you know, there are going to be games coming out that are massively expensive to make that just kind of makes sense to put them on other platforms. Um, I do note that the ones that um, I've, I've looked into this now with uh, okay. the power of Google. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, and it turns out that it's, uh, it's Jeff Grubb who has been uh, a 
apparently eyeing up Switch release for uh, Sea of Thieves. Uh, similar story from Axios journalist Stephen Totillo. I'm oh, just right. quoting the Eurogamer news story here. So it does seem to be widely sourced. And um, yeah, there's also been these accompanying rumours that Hi-Fi Rush would appear on right. Switch, might appear on PlayStation. Just kind of makes sense from my perspective. It's a That's a great game that should just get better exposure. Yeah, if you look at what's... So Hi-Fi Rush obviously did very well at the end of the year in terms of nominations. In fact, it was the one game that showed up on on both or on mine, Oliver, and Tom's uh, Games of the Year list. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's been a lot of talk about it in general. It's like interest is high again. I feel like putting it out on other platforms that interest returns. People have been seeing all this. They want to buy it. But it's also going to continue to be on Game Pass. So people might say, well, you know, get it there, get on PC, whatever. Uh, but then something like Sea of Thieves is a little different because that is, it is a live service game. And actually one of the few that I really <laughs> I actually enjoyed, I have to admit, I liked Sea of Thieves. Uh, I feel like that type of game specifically benefits from having more users. Wouldn't you agree? Like you want more people in that ecosystem, more people playing that game. Absolutely, and if you can get yeah. it on other platforms, then there you go, it's a win. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But what yeah, about like makes... the big IPs though? And maybe you have an idea. And this is a well, I specific like Halo, Gears, Forza. I know. I, I, I mean, do you think I that don't... could show up on these competing platforms? I mean, I don't know if I can say if they will, but I would say just why not? Xbox Series X and PlayStation Five are so close to one another in the power levels, the DBZ power levels, <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that of course, why not have them running there? Have more people playing your Halo game across of everything. I, I'm not at all wedded to the concept that uh, just because they also make consoles means the games that they make only should come out on the consoles that they produce. Otherwise, you wouldn't have stuff on PC or you wouldn't have those breakaway examples like we talked about earlier with Minecraft Legends. And will be the show. Um, there's a handful. Hell Divers two, which is just coming out now on PC. Um, so that's going to be day to date. Uh, I, I for me, like, I I really think that Microsoft has probably, and I feel there's like a certain resignation whenever it's talked about with Phil Spencer that they know they lost the war <laughs> and uh, they need to prepare for a future that is different. And they have to disrupt to do that. And I think this is the best way to do it for them because well, like, you're only having to have this limited market base of people on Xbox consoles uh, for the foreseeable future. And why not open it up to the wider gaming public? Uh, I, I see, especially if Sony is so dominant or if Switch, Nintendo Switch is so dominant. Um, you want to foster relationships of the future and just relying on the relationships that you formed in the past with a, like a diehard fan base that just does keeps and only buying Xbox stuff. Uh, I don't see that's like a viable future to grow. So if they're a business that likes money, this this all makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's the way that the console would become basically uh, irrelevant to Xbox. That's just not going to happen because um, Microsoft needs to have a way for people to easily access Game Pass, right? And um, an easily accessible way to to, to do that, to get mm-hmm. hold of those games. And you're not going to have Game Pass on PlayStation anytime soon. Um, you know, even though, of course, EA and um, Ubisoft yeah. and whatnot have their subscription services yeah, available so, on PlayStation. So it, it's very interesting, like, at what point do does, like, is there, like, a turning point? Because, you know, like, you have, like, multiple stores on, like, various devices. The PC is an example. Android phones, I guess you can do that. Um, I don't know. Like, there's, like, all these court cases. Yeah, Epic, yeah, yeah. Tim Sweeney. You know, like, at what point is there just, like, a breaking down of walls and walled gardens are declared not okay at some point? And you have to actually support other stores on your marketplace, even like on a on a closed system i i could see that happening in the future at some point in time because uh especially like with this uh abk uh microsoft merger like you saw that sony tried to argue that this is like bad uh for a variety of reasons uh and it didn't go through like i feel like then this is just in the opposite direction microsoft could argue 
for allowing Game Pass and their store, maybe with a percentage cut as a giveaway, like giving leeway to them. But I could see this totally happening in the next 10 years. I, I don't see it as inevitable. And I think uh, continuing to offer that console makes a ton of sense too, because yes, you can get into PC space, of course, but having that pre-configured box that you can just throw up on your TV and expect a good, solid experience from it is right. key. That's what a lot of people still want, right? And yeah. I think that's that's very smart. So yeah, you need a vehicle to make this yeah. stuff more accessible because you know, uh, you know, it's it's a shame, but the PC is still somewhat impenetrable to to many people. And <laughs> it's the concept of just having a plug and play alternative, you know, something hey, like yeah, this, something like, like this, yeah, <laughs> like that, right. like that. Hey, Rich, that <laughs> I heard that might have fallen off the back of a truck. <laughs> I was reading the comments. People were like, "Where did the Rich get this thing?" Like they were saying, basically. Did Rich buy stolen goods? Was the question. <laughs> Rich, is we can never thing? know. <laughs> we'll never know. Well, you know, um, if, if it was stolen, they did steal the controller. <laughs> yeah, that was in a different pile. Oh yeah, that was in a different pile. Different yeah. fuck. <laughs> yeah, it was in a different track. No, if you honestly go on Facebook Marketplace, uh, I'm still <laughs> seeing like 100, 120 pound uh, Xbox Series S consoles there. I mean, it's it's astonishing. I think it's like the, the tech giveaway of the. Of the century. Oh yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's just yeah. quite remarkable how much machine you're Actually, getting for so low a price on there. Thinking about that, what if so I mentioned earlier about the portable PCs refitting Windows to be more like a Steam Deck experience. What if in the future, when they roll out a new Xbox, they have a console and a handheld version, and the handheld one is more like the Series S, where it is more wow. like a Steam Deck system, and maybe you can dock it still. Uh and, but it behaves like the actual console they sell and everything. Like that could be, that's it's actually really compelling, idea. right? I think it's that would an be interesting awesome. Interesting idea, yeah. I mean, um, hmm, it's an interesting idea, but it does require quite a lot of developmental I, effort. To I, I, I agree. I think it would, but imagine. I mean, I'm just imagining them working with, like, say, Nvidia or something. And like it's both in the new console and they have this handheld developed, uh, which hopefully it like should the be, switch to like the switch, <laughs> too. Like switch to maybe more potent. But, you know, that that sort of idea, I feel like mm -hmm. I feel like that actually would be genuinely compelling and something new, different that uh, I mean, I don't think Sony's going to go back to that anytime soon. And if it's right. actually like a Series X, Series S relationship, they would run the same games. Uh, which is key. Hmm. It's an interesting idea. I think fundamentally, though, Microsoft are looking in terms of disruption now at this point. They've realized that the traditional console model isn't really doing them any favors anymore. Yeah. There was the shift to PC and multi-platform development in that sense. And I don't think it's it's actually been bad for them or the games at all. Nope. when you think about it and i think it's just no. right now i mean development is expensive these big games take so much money like sony's yeah. been bringing games to the pc right i don't think they necessarily wanted to do that given the way that they've always treated their platforms right but it's clearly become something that they've had to embrace uh to actually help pay for this stuff perhaps and it ended up working out well but like you know, it's clear that these games just take a lot of money to make and you got to find ways to make it back however you can. The mm. only one I could, I really see just kind of sticking to their guns is Nintendo. Right. And if Nintendo ever, if there's ever a point where it's completely not viable, and I think it would be tough to get to that point for Nintendo because they can, they can eat some failures in a row as we've seen before. Uh, mm. I, you know, I think Nintendo remains focused on their own very specific closed platform. And yeah, I saw people I mean, talking like, well, if, if the Switch gets Hi-Fi Rush, what does Nintendo give any in return? And I'm like, Hi-Fi Rush on the Switch benefits Microsoft much more than it benefits Nintendo, right? Like mm -hmm. Nintendo, they, they don't really need it or care, I'm sure. It's just like another game on their platform, yeah. uh, no matter yeah. how good it is, right? Like Nintendo is not going to part with their precious IP uh, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I think, you know, what's quite interesting about the whole Nintendo thing is that people differentiate them from Sony and Microsoft when fundamentally they're all competing yeah, for the time they, of gamers. Exactly. The time how of they, gamers. It doesn't matter. They the power doesn't matter. they carve themselves off into this separate niche Mind sim shows. simply because they've got like a lower power uh, platform, I think is quite remarkable, you know. Mm -hmm. 
the power is almost irrelevant seemingly when you look at the uh, amount of, of units they've sold and the success that they've enjoyed. That's good. It's, uh, it's Arguably, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the direction of travel just seems to be that uh, more, mi more Microsoft games are going to be appearing on more platforms simply by virtue of the kind of acquisitions that they've done, you know, um, Activision, they're contractually bound to put Call of Duty on every system. Now, mm -hmm. what what's in it for Microsoft? Well, it's pretty obvious. You know, if, if you subscribe to Game Pass, you, you kind of don't have to buy the games in the traditional sense. So that's, you know, the funny thing is, though, that they have opened up this remarkable revenue stream from Game Pass subscribers, where, you know, if you want to play the game early, you end up paying an extra, like, $40 anyway. Right. <laughs> you know, they did it with Forza Horizon. They did it with mm. um, uh, Starfield. So right, you know, right. it's, it's quite interesting to see that, you know, they're, they're still able to ramp up revenues in that way. Starfield had an amazing amount of concurrent users before yeah, it, it officially pre, launched. It officially launched. Yeah, it was big. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess my message to, to the Xbox diehards is, you know, kind of don't worry about it. You know, the, the amount of games that are coming is not going to change. It's just going to be, and I don't think the concept of an Xbox console is going away anytime nope. soon. You just don't you know, be too concerned when PlayStation is, is selling considerably more than Xbox. That's not really um, the end game for Microsoft anymore. Mm. I mean, they've kind of conceded that ground. I think Phil's comment was basically that um, the war for the digital library, as we know it, was, was waged in the last generation of PlayStation yeah. 1. And people want to be able to take their games going forward. Microsoft's response to that is basically to give you all of those games within a monthly subscription, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really interesting take. Um, I guess we're going to be following this story with much interest, but um, right now there is no official confirmation whatsoever. We do have um, next week a, a new developer underscore direct. Right, um, yeah. That'll be great. I'm excited well, about the being shut off there. Yeah, there's there's some great games being uh, revealed there and or re-revealed or whatever. But the point is, will we get any idea of strategy from that? Probably not. But it will sort of reinforce that there's some great stuff coming from Microsoft this year. Uh, and, and with that, I think we talked out on this one. Anything more to mm -hmm. add? Put Killer Instinct on PlayStation. I would love <laughs> that. I mean, get more people in those lobbies. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, more people playing is, is mm -hmm. not a bad thing, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, one thing that did appear at CES this week, which we were kind of expecting, but probably not at that venue, was um, the announcement that Horizon Forbidden West, the complete edition, is coming out uh, on PC. A trailer was revealed, and um, we got quite a few supporter questions about this. Um, but first of all, Alex, thoughts about this? Uh, yeah, this is good to see. Once again, not a really great confirmed release date for this yet. I think it's going to be early Q1 2024. Uh, just like the feeling what, in the room at the, yeah, like now. We're in Q1, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, these things kind of just come out sometimes, you know, yeah, like I, I don't think there was like a large buildup before release for many of these games. Um, and uh, so I'm excited to see it. The trailer did look good. It was noticeably, it was very crisp. It was very fluid. Not a lot of drop frames. All those things I like to see in a trailer. Um, and it is going to be supporting the things that Nixie's uh, has shown in the past that they're really good at supporting. You're going to get your ultra wide. You're going to get your DLAA now with the LSS. You're going to get Reflex, which I think they've supported in every single title they've released so far and you're gonna get dlss3 frame generation um and as as a part of this too since they they always make an emphasis on this the trailer doesn't say other technologies that they support but they're gonna support them they are going to support fsr iterations including frame generation and they will definitely support xcss yeah um so. yeah like there's they wouldn't that's just not their what they do um but i think after the in the wake of this trailer i think a number of people and i would say including myself are a little bit sad to not see especially since this was shown off uh 
in the context of Nvidia talking about the game uh, with like this trailer releasing coinciding with Nvidia's press releases regarding their CES announcements, uh, that there was no mentioning of ray tracing, path tracing, anything of those uh, sort. And in the past, uh, the games that Nixies has been working on from Insomniac at least have had ray tracing features on PC and extra ray tracing features on PC. Extra. And extra, yes. There, there's there's two minds to this. One is it's incredible to actually see uh, them put in the time to add in extra ray tracing features in their PC versions. They put in like RTAO, ray trace shadows, or increase the quality of the pre-existing reflections in the Spider-Man games, for example when they hit PC. Uh, and those are all really great things that I'd love to see in a PC port. But at the same time, if the engine doesn't natively support it, there is an argument that it would cost a lot of time and money to support it for a PC version uh, where it would really only end up showing in that PC version and it wouldn't maybe benefit the console side of things at all. So there's maybe not a good like production schedule and reason to add that to a PC version yeah. uh, from the pr from the publisher's perspective. I'm pretty sure if you asked anyone working at Gorilla or at Nixies if they wanted to see ray tracing in this game, they would probably say, "Yeah, we like good graphics too. We like to we would love <laughs> to add those things to a game." Uh, but uh, you know, like it's more like a question of production schedule. Uh, I mean, we'll see when it comes out. Like. Maybe the upgrade and image quality and other aspects are good enough where this isn't really a big deal at all. Um, but, you know, things like shadows, you know, nothing wrong with yeah. ever increasing shadow quality. I mean, let's let's take a couple of supporter questions on this, but you've kind of uh, dovetailed into it? that already. Yeah. Uh, this one from uh, Chris Toffin. Hello, gentlemen. I was mm. admittedly a wee disappointed when the Horizon <laughs> Forbidden West PC trailer dropped with no mention of raid facing support. I was hoping that Nixis would uh, manage to pull a rabbit out of a hat and add RT into an engine that lacks the feature on PS5. Uh, my question, what are the chances that Nixis does end up adding in some sort of raid facing support, whether at or post launch? Uh, I, I do think it's kind of unlikely. My personal take on this is that Gorilla are already looking into their own uh, ray tracing support for the engine that would work on PlayStation consoles, and that will eventually dovetail into whatever happens on PC. So in a sense, it could be like a duplication of effort unless the PC stuff could migrate back into the console stuff. Right. Kind, kind of seems a bit unlikely. Um, Paul Kalamata asks, with all of the NVIDIA features that were present in the uh, Horizon trailer at CES. Are you disappointed there's no mention of RT? Well, yes. It would have been cool to see a fully path face version of the game. And do it you expect have. to see any other graphical improvements to the game besides better AA from DLSS slash DLAA implementation? Um, yes, it is a tricky one because the game as is is already quite spectacular. I guess there is stuff that you can do, you know, like what they did with Horizon uh, Zero Dawn, you right. know, where potentially you could... Uh, do stuff like I mean it does basically come down to resolution frame rate and stuff like shadows doesn't it <laughs> really? it is it's usually the usual port territory stuff the one thing that I actually would have loved to have seen but they didn't do and I would probably require art time and maybe balancing like a lot of the game would be porting Nubis 2.0 back to the original version of the game you know like the the, the DLC for the game added a new cloud system yeah. and replacing the old one. And so it's going to be a little awkward on PC where you have like uh, the the burning, it's called Burning Shores, right? Mm -hmm. The the expansion pack is probably going to be running heavier than the base game, even though they're going to look very similar just because one game has a completely different cloud system. Uh, that's going to be interesting, actually. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, looking back at Horizon and even Death Stranding, which were both uh, Decima games ported to PC, they didn't really do much with like draw distance and stuff like that. They were kind of like yeah. minor tweaks. They're, you know, the sort of standard 
sort of tweaks that PC versions get or extra options were, were kind of thin on the ground, weren't they? Yeah, that's the one thing, like, especially for these games when they're open world, that was one thing that I was disappointed with, with Death Stranding, where it's like, it was so obvious if you just, like, <laughs> increase the draw distance for a lot of things, the game would just look a lot better. Yes. Uh, but they they just never did. There's, like, a tiny little difference there with that PC version. Uh, and it's, like, low-hanging fruit. Hmm. Uh, because it's probably just in, like a variable in the engine for a variety of different assets. Um, and I would hope that that is a thing that is prioritized here because you know when people talk about the game, like or people like when we're talking about like Avatar or any of the Ubisoft games, like one of the great things about them on PC is that you can like there's like an extra streaming distance detail slider that usually goes from like zero to one hundred in Ubisoft games. Um, and having that here would just future proof it, you know, like. Get rid of all of those LOD transitions if you want. Why not? <laughs> that would be an yeah. option. Why not? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think and why not? I, 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 John? What? Make Why everything not? make things future proof, baby. Like yeah, we don't we don't need everything to run well now, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah, who cares? Yeah. Like just make everything extreme. Like the one of my favorite realizations in the original crisis is that there's C vars for essentially turning off distant lods and you can just like push <laughs> all the vegetation out to the horizon at full detail. Why not? It's freaking ridiculous, but it's awesome that you can do it. And yeah. I want to see that more in games. <laughs> That's I, a, sorry, that's an interesting uh, alternative take on the unobtainium settings on uh, Avatar, yeah. which was to enable them with a with a launch parameter. Uh, the other option is simply to have a console that pops up and yeah, you can yeah, just yeah. Bring back change the C bars that just make things totally ridiculous. Why yes. not? Yeah, I love that awesome. stuff. Like, oh man, that's like, that's that's the, a quarter of playing the crisis. Console. <laughs> yeah. I love the Why command not? console. It's so good. There's uh, too many tilde keys that are being underutilized. Oh my gosh! Don't let me start talking about the tilde key. There's a if you've used German keyboards, you'll know that there's like the, depending upon the way you program your keyboard input on Windows, like sometimes like actually getting the the console to pop up in a game with a German keyboard or a non-US standard keyboard is impossible. Um, really quick thing about that. So like other low-hanging fruit, cutscene character models in game. Oh yeah, sure. Why why not? Do it. Right? Like do it. Sure. Uh got seen shading in game. Uh the ability to turn off hero lighting. I mean, why not? Like allow people to customize the game as much as possible, push it up as far. If we're not gonna get ray tracing, you might as well do or that. So. Extra hero lighting. Let them extra, control yeah, make just where like Jesus the like glowing. Yeah, <laughs> like, lens flares. Like, like, lens lens flares. <laughs> like just emanating off of her hair. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Like uh like surely these things are possible and when i when the game comes out obviously just making sure it runs well and has like the usual nixie's flair is good uh but i would also like to as a part of that review saying like but does it push it far enough like that's like one of the cool things about pc but does it push it far enough hmm. right yeah a uh, final question from selwyn Naples. uh the horizon forbidden west end video features trailer highlighted an issue for me the wording hmm. slash branding used for frame generation. The trailer mentions DLSS 3 performance boost, but that can also mean via DLSS right. scaling, not just frame gen. It was remarkably vague, in my opinion. What do you think? Will it have frame gen or not? I think it's almost certain that it will. Yeah, yeah it will. I mean, He's right, though. The, the the way that this stuff is worded is always a little bit weird, right? Mm -hmm. I Agreed. feel like they're almost afraid to say the word frame generation to some degree because right. people perceive it so negatively, which I think is, Dude. I understand where that concern comes from, but I think when you actually, when it's working well, it's, it's genuinely amazing. Yeah. I think we've discussed that before. It's, it's one of these yeah. things where when it, you know, when it was first revealed, um, there was a lot of suspicion and uh, negative publicity around it. But first of all, it's been validated by Intel and AMD producing their own solutions. Secondly, I think it's been validated by gamers who are using it because, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. It's not without its issues, but it's it's certainly uh, additive to the experience rather than sort of subtractive in most cases. So, yeah, it's right. been an interesting example there of um, that but there is a certain uh, reticence to embrace new features or to accept that they are actually good. And obviously, it is a first-gen take on the tech. It's going to get better, obviously. One thing I do want to mention, though, is that uh, FSR 3 is also out there, right? 
And I found that right. that frame generation does still have issues. Uh, if you're not right. locking down to the target, I guess, refresh rate. And yeah, so right. I mean, people, you can't, you can't, you can't getting better. I think it, I'm, yeah. I'm, it is going to get better. I believe they're going to fix this problem. But the point is, is if you just see one iteration of frame generation, it just happens to be that you might form some opinions about the way frame generation works in general, uh, rather than, you know, perhaps not realizing that FSR three currently does have issues with this. It basically means like it doesn't function properly in, in VRR space where you get judder at every single game I've tested with. It has this problem. So yeah. do you want to talk about that now? Because there was a bit of feedback to your uh, avatar. Uh, yeah, sure. Alex, because um, yeah. you showed it with an overlay running and um, the feedback from uh, users was, whoa, hold on a minute. AMD is saying in their documentation, don't use uh, overlays. Well, uh, there's a lot to say about that. <laughs> uh, uh, there's there's two things. One thing is uh, we've, we've double blind tested this internally. Uh, the overlay is not affecting frame time uh, for FSR3. We've double tested this internally. So when you see us running uh, an overlay, I literally could have just hidden that and you would have never even noticed. But uh, like the reason why we're running that is because we're FCATing the, we're injecting FCAT into the game. The overlay doesn't matter. I'm not even paying attention to whatever that frame time measurement is on the overlay. We're not doing that. We're looking at, FCAT marking up the left-hand border of the game and showing where the fair the, the tears are occurring and then based upon just in our internal tools and the length of how much of the color bar is showing up on the left-hand screen we know the exact frame time and that's where you start seeing uh and it's not all over a game when you have FSR 3 on if you're in like a light area you don't see this necessarily but if the, the, the heavier it gets the more things that are occurring on screen there's, there's a larger differential between the runty frames that are very small sometimes like four milliseconds almost a little bit more than four milliseconds uh and then ones that go up to like 12 which is like an eight millisecond variation and that's like seeing v-sync drops on a 120 hertz display so that's that's what it is like visually it is vrring maybe depending upon your display um but the whole point is there's such variation between each frame time that's the thing. So that's one thing I want to say is that we've internally verified that us adding FCAT onto the border of a game is not affecting FSR 3 frame times. We've double checked this multiple games. We've triple checked it because yeah. well, there's, there's, there's a few <laughs> ways. First of all, there's, there's, there's straight eyeballing, right? Where you right. don't use the overlay at all. And uh, you could, when you are talking about the frame time variances you're talking about, it is similar to VSync Judder. And um, I think all three of us actually went through and tested this and noticed it. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the concept that the overlay is, is impacting frame times uh, because it says it in the AMD documentation. Uh, we actually spoke to AMD about this and we also double tested it by using, um, we double tested it by using our uh, frame time calculation system that we use on the consoles. So, you know, right. basically using the, algorithms that detect where the tail lines are and therefore calculating the persistence of a frame. And it was basically the same as with FCAT, mm -hmm. uh, which was using the overlay. So, you know, I think it's fair enough to point out, okay, well, the AMD documents say this, and maybe we, sh uh, you know, probably should have included a sentence or two in there. But the point yeah. is that A, we spoke to AMD about it and shared our findings, and B, we went through it to check that this was an accurate way of testing by, you know, first of all, using our eyes, <laughs> and secondly, by using our backup algorithms that we use with consoles, which produce the same effect. So yeah. I do think there's base. you know, we'll talk about this. I think you're doing an AMD uh, FSR3 video. It's, um, the it's the next week's video after this current one that I'm working on comes out. Yep. Okay, yeah. So we, we'll go into, the, go into the weeds a bit on that one. But yeah, we're fairly confident in our thoughts on it at the moment. But, you know, again, at the same time, I'd say that what you are seeing there is huge improvement over what we saw in <laughs> Immortals of Avium and, and Sporfoken. Oh my which, gosh. Which really was like problematic. So there's, yeah. there's forward traction there and these are emerging technologies. You know, nobody should be expecting the finished article 
day one. The, the whole point is too, is if you're getting negative feedback about something, it isn't saying it's going to be this way forever. Actually pointing right, out negative right. aspects about maybe the way the frames are being paced is going to lead to improvements in FSR 3. What if everyone just was hunky-dory and said, <laughs> oh yeah, FSR 3 came out. It's so good that it doesn't work with VRR at all. What if everyone said that? What's yeah, the point? Yeah, exactly. Then like, so, nothing would like, get better. And it, it, like, it, like in our original DLSS 3 review video, I was like, this not working with VSync is a huge bummer. Like, you're going to have to stick within the window of VRR to not get frame tearing? This is awful. Uh, like, yeah, this is this is so limited in use. And guess what? NVIDIA adds VSync support. Like, that's good to have the press be critical of aspects of things over time um and i think that's helpful in the end and i'm we'll see what happens like the one thing is that i'm going to be covering fsr three frame generation uh in an upcoming video where actually a big part of that is going to be me looking at fsr three mods oh. and i'm I'm going to be a little bit weary of that i'm going to like in the video i'm going to say like i'm going to be looking at fsr3 being injected into games where it is not natively supported so you have to like have a like a little bit of like pinch of salt there that this is not completely native uh not in regards to quality but also maybe in terms of frame pacing because you know if it's not officially supported maybe there's some issue there actually with the interfacing uh but yeah that's coming up it's coming mm -hmm. up Okay, fair enough. Where well, we sort of deviated massively there. <laughs> Sorry okay, about that. Why not <laughs> add that in time code? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's move on to our next news topic. Okay, so we're back in CES land at the moment. Um, obviously, there was the NVIDIA uh, reveal of the Super Series GPUs, which we'll be reviewing in due course. But um, some of the stuff which we were kind of half briefed on or briefed on, which we couldn't talk about until the actual conference. Um, well, there's some actually really interesting stuff happening. And uh, actually, we should probably kick it off, Alex, with this uh, with this question from one of my favorite supporters, Dr. Uh -oh. I. Crappenshitz. <laughs> uh, he basically says, can you explain G-Sync Pulsar? Now, G-Sync Pulsar was announced at CES 2024, and it is potentially very exciting stuff, right? So can you explain it? Sure. Um, G-Sync Pulsar is the merging of two technologies that NVIDIA has had and I think they came around the same time originally. Uh, when G-Sync came out, the monitors that supported G-Sync, to my knowledge, almost all of them also supported something called Ultra Low Motion Blur, also known as ULMB, uh, which would strobe the backlight of the display to, in, to decrease persistence blur, as in the blur that your eyes get from seeing a sample and hold display displaying an image and then holding onto it until the next frame's ready and then starting to roll that one out. You have ULMB rolling out at the same time as G-Sync, but the limitation there is G-Sync is trying to make it so that the graphics card is controlling the refresh rate of the monitor. ULMB, and it's one version one, version two implementation, requires the monitor's refresh rate to be fixed for it to even work because the pulsing is regular, it's happening in beat, with um, the monitor's refresh rate. Uh, the, the, this is a limiting thing because let's say you have a 240 hertz monitor, which is becoming more and more popular every day, or 144 hertz, let's say, to get the benefits of ULMB one or two, you would have to maintain that frame rate with the refresh rate. And that is not very realistic for modern games. It's really only applicable to very old games usually. So you'd have to make this choice of, do I want to have less blur when objects are moving or when my you know camera's panning, or do I want to have the ability for frame rate drops to occur without getting V-Sync shutter? It's the difference between G-Sync and ULMB. G-Sync Pulsar is supposed to combine these technologies by varying the timing of the pulse of the backlight in, t in tune with what G-Sync's frame um, G-Sync's refresh rate adjustments are doing. Um, I haven't seen it in person. No. That's the one thing. So like NVIDIA is talking about this. I haven't seen it in person at CES. I'm going to assume it works <laughs> because <laughs> they're saying it does. Um, in the past, there's been what John's talked about. You can hijack uh, an LG CX and C1 to do this. Can't you, John? Oh, so there was kind of a weird thing in the firmware previously where when you used Dolby Vision input, they did not disable the... So on OLEDs, it's different 
let me explain that first. Yeah, if you're cool. talking about with ULMB is strobing, and that's specifically because LCDs use a backlight to uh, basically display the. It's a pixel layer. Or it's the layer with a backlight, and the light is what allows you to see it in any conditions, right? And by flickering it on and off, it more closely simulates, say, like uh, an impulse style display, like a CRT. Where the reason CRTs don't really have this sort of motion blur is due to the way that the image is drawn. Although in that case, it's more line by line, right? It's scan lines rather than like an it's entire better. image at one time, which is really cool. I'd like to emulate that one day uh, if displays are fast enough. Um, but OLED, of course, has self-lighting pixels, so it doesn't need that. You don't actually turn off the backlight. So to achieve a similar effect, you use what I've always talked about, black frame insertion, where you're essentially blanking the pixels out for X amount of time between before showing a new image. And by doing that, you achieve the same thing and actually better than LCD because OLED pixels are instant response, but uh, you get persistence blur due to the way that the your retina perceives these images when displayed in a sample and hold fashion, right? So black frame insertion solves that. Now on specific LG models, for whatever reason, I think it's because Dolby uh, Vision was relatively new. You could still enable black frame insertion with Dolby Vision Engage, and it actually did work. So you could you could do VRR and uh, BFI. The problem there is that it was clearly not intended because if the frame rate dropped below like say eighty frames per second, maybe ninety, something like that, uh, it would flicker in a way that I would describe only as dangerous for some people, mm -hmm. where it's like you can imagine like real hardcore heavy flickering where it's like, it's hard to look at because it's, it's too much. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you know, if you're between like say 90 and 120, then it actually worked really well, which was cool to see, but clearly it wasn't ready. It's not implemented uh, in any of their current sets. And it was never really an intended feature. This though is an intended feature. And that's exactly what it's designed to solve is to give you that sort of, Motion clarity in line with, say, a CRT, which is one of the key reasons why I've continued to harp upon them for so many years, because the motion clarity is so far beyond sample and hold displays. Uh, but because of the support for VRR within the Pulsar spec, it's actually kind of taking things further. So if the motion clarity really is as good as they're saying, and we're hoping this could conceivably offer better performance than a CRT, because you can't Re realistically do VRR on a CRT. There's actually some hacky ways that you can do it on a CRT, which very strange, not really officially supported, but you can kind of force it to change the refresh rate in real time. Mm -hmm. It is just analog electronics after all. Uh, but yeah, this, this is extremely promising. And my only real question right now is in all the documentation, everything they're talking about here, uh, they're only referring to strobing and LCDs specifically. And I think we've asked them to clarify this to see right. if we haven't heard back yet, because I think they're all busy at CES. Uh, but presumably this would also work on OLED type displays. Uh, it would rather than strobing the backlight, you're essentially inserting blanking periods between uh, drawing the pixels. So hopefully it's supported there as well, because, you know, I mean, all three of us were on OLED OLEDs at this point. I think that's where a lot of we saw it a lot at CES as well. There's a lot of PC focused OLED displays in the works on the way. Uh, yeah. So I think it would behoove NVIDIA to make sure that this is also feasible for OLED type displays. And the other thing right. I was curious about is strobing the backlight. You're talking about strobing the entire backlight, right? Would this, I'm, I'm curious if this would even be compatible with local dimming because one of the solutions to LCDs, terrible contrast ratio if i'm honest has been local dimming and that means breaking up the backlight into many 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 zones right that's where this whole i think it's my is it micro led uh i forget what one of them is referring mini? to a future is it mini led because i think micro, is the current one okay mini might be the current one and micro is the one that's we won't see for like 10 oh more gosh, years gosh i can't even remember yeah like it's whatever micro? sony's now using for their top end uh uh, display yeah. and we're starting to see it show up i think it's in the ipad as well as the ipad pros now use this yeah uh, but right. either way it's it's many many little uh, led elements that can all be individually switched on and off and varied and that helps a lot with contrast right because you can actually switch off parts of the screen but the question is will that work with pulsar 
because then you're dealing with a much more complex backlight than just strobing the entire thing on and off. So there's still a lot of questions here that I have about how this is going to work, but conceptually what they're offering here is a huge win for anybody that values motion clarity. And even if you think you don't value, value it yet, I can guarantee that at least with most people, if you show them the difference, show them what this provides, they'll, they'll be genuinely surprised and shocked at how much better things look. Right. right. It makes a huge difference. It's also a meeting of like a halfway point of combining technologies. Cause like to otherwise get that COT clarity, John's talked about before, like the blur busters research of about a thousand Hertz, yep. like getting actually a thousand Hertz, even with frame generation, which generation of frame generation are we talking about here? Is the future? We're not there yet. <laughs> We're not there yet. We're not there yet on a lot of levels. No. So getting us to at least get there by strobing as combined with VRR to just, you know, you just say like, okay, we can't get games to run, run that fast. Then this is a great way to do that. Um, probably also combined with frame gen at this point. And if we had something like 360 to 480 hertz displays, but they have like the performance of something even greater than it, like 1000 hertz, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, other innovations at CES, um, there was the announcement that G-Sync is coming to GeForce now, which, uh, wow, that's a, that's a big deal, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, like uh, it does require a local, uh, presuming they're going to be doing G-Sync only, at the moment i don't know if they're gonna uh, support adaptive sync uh, like like do we know like if it actually does support for example like free sync or something like that i, I, I don't know they're just talking um, about g-sync well they're, they're just saying, talking about g-sync st um, streaming to displays that support g-sync but you know there's there's different flavors of g-sync right right uh, like so in tvs for instance they don't have a g-sync module and i think most displays right. these days that support g-sync with the badge or whatever also do not use a specific the module, module anymore. anymore yeah so it's it's gone above that now yeah. um this is good because previously you could like rich has talked about it like you can have that uh really low latency experience maybe by using geforce now like ultimate tier is what they call it mm -hmm. um but the fluidity of the image being provided to you is just, it looks like a V-synced image on your yeah. display. And maybe even worse, actually. Um, it's worse. It's probably worse. Uh, then this, presuming it lines up really well and actually is forcing the refresh rate of the monitor to change. And I really am very curious about like what codec this is. How is it like overtaking like full screen and windowed modes on PCs. Like what, what is it exactly doing that it is allowed can actually do this? Cause not a lot of programs on your PC actually engage VRR behavior, even on the desktop. Um, so and if you force it, it can be a uh, ruinous, like try to have <laughs> it can be detrimental. VRR turned on while editing in premiere, not a fun time. Yeah. It's not, not good <laughs> there. Uh, so it is interesting. I want to know how they did it. Once again, these are questions we sent off to NVIDIA. We're hoping we get, get answers back, but I actually like this one a lot because it makes it like, it's going to reduce the latency uh, of what your eye is seeing on stream because you're going to be getting it and you're also going to be getting the benefits of reflex even more then because reflex is always going to be running sub uh, refresh rate anyways you know sub uh, native refresh rate so like 117 116 and uh, usually 100 torch display so mm. a lot of good stuff there I actually this like is basically the only issue I have with GeForce now at this point is that you get 4080 tier class performance so it is actually very very fast but when you're on a 4K 120 display like mine, um, you know, the games will often run in, you know, sort of 80 to 90 frames per second. So, you know, you either yep, yep, lock yep. down to 60 where you uh, get a more consistent look, but you get more intrusive latency or you run it in 120 hertz mode, but you get the judder. So in theory, you just run it in 120 hertz mode without the judder. Uh, if this all goes to, to plan, I guess, which right. would make this service even better. It was already excellent. So, you know, this is kind of like the cherry on top almost. It's, it's, it's the only streaming service I've ever used that actually looked pretty good to me. Yeah. Uh, even though we could still tell the difference. I remember when they NVIDIA tried to trick us at uh, Gamescom and it was like an instant. <laughs> they weren't tricked. <laughs> no, it wasn't trick a trick. They, they, were, they, were see, they, they were seeing if we could tell the difference. <laughs> no, I know. It's not a, not a trick, not a trick. But yeah. it's the wrong word there. What I mean is it was like basically trying to see how long it would take us to suss out 
which one was a direct <laughs> feed and <laughs> which one was actually being streamed. Yeah, and it, and it, it took about a things. second. <laughs> but but still, even then, it's actually a pretty impressive service that does genuinely look good and better than any other streaming I've used. But the, the big problem with streaming has always been... Uh, due to the nature of the internet, getting perfect frame times can be sometimes tricky. And it's not just frame rate drops. You also sometimes get interruptions to when the frame appears, causing subtle judder, uh, V-Sync mm-hmm. judder. It looks like V-Sync judder or frame pacing issues sometimes. So it's not like 100% smooth, but it feels like VRR support could actually kind of fix that, solve that. Assuming there's like no, for example, like another thing that I've thought about is if there's input latency variations that they're receiving. Mm. So they, you're doing a, a pan with a mouse and it should be smooth on your end in terms of the arc. But based upon when the samples are right. that are actually reaching NVIDIA HQ for that, it could actually, those could be packet missing whatever and they could be not actually linear at that point and what they'd send back to you is technically correct but it wouldn't be linear movement anymore so I, there's there's i mean that's something that i don't know how you would lab that right. exactly maybe you'd send them like i don't know maybe you'd purposely disrupt your internet connection and see what the visual results looks like that'd be something interesting to look at um but yeah I think streaming still is a little bit more to go, even maybe beyond this. We'll see. I guess we'll just have to wait and see, but I do really want to check it out. So yeah. um very curious to see when I'm actually going to roll that one out. Uh, but with that, let's move on to our next piece. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to John here because he's just put something on the docket which reads, Surprise things from John <laughs> dash he he. <laughs> he he. Well, yeah. uh, gentlemen... I wanted to Uh-oh. mention this because it's kind of unexpected, I guess, but uh, I mistakenly ordered something. Oh, no. And it's this. Oh, it's a Steam you, Deck you OLED. A, a Steam Deck. <laughs> wow. So, oh, heck yeah. <laughs> I, did, I did go ahead and get the Steam Deck OLED. Oh, it boy. Was, it was almost an accident, but I said, whatever, let's do it. What do you mean almost an accident? Uh, so How could you accidentally I, order a I was tempted to get it. I added it to my <sighs> cart on Steam. Uh, oh, yeah. And then I didn't click buy. I was like, whatever. Uh, and then a deal came up for some game. And I was like, oh, I'll just add that to my Steam library. And I just clicked through as I always do. And then at the end, it said how much it charged me. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it was oh, <laughs> oh so, my God. So I was like, mm, uh, oh, it's a right. sign. It's, uh, I may as well do it. <laughs> so, so, yes, I, I do have this. Uh, okay. And... It's awesome. I, I do like it a, a lot, actually. What was the first game that you installed on it? Um, the first game I installed on it was... What was that? I think, weirdly enough, I think it was like Freedom Planet 2. Okay. Oh, okay. Just because what it's was a, the it's first a, HDR showcase uh, game that you installed Ori. on it? My God, okay. Ori. Ori in the Will of the Wisps. Holy moly, that looks good on there. Like Seeing that running on a small little HDR screen with that kind of like brightness and intensity it's it's genuinely stunning it looks so freaking great i mean awesome. it's like having it, like a mini lg oled in your hands at, at least yeah and if and not only that the game runs at like 90 frames per second yes. not issue it's like completely yeah. super smooth like so that's kind of my my big thing here is i've used original steam deck enough and i famously did not like the screen <laughs> this, this is night and day it makes it actually makes the thing feel like it got an inter massive internal upgrade even though it didn't just because right. of the screen it's so it's such a difference and that extra 90 hertz as well because uh, a lot of games on steam can just run at 90 frames per second without issue on the steam deck you know lower right. end games mind you but uh, stuff yeah, that, nonetheless it nonetheless works. it's cool when it's possible but even then like and i was aware of this but i really now appreciate how good valve's interface is for interacting with things like the refresh rate just being right. able to hit it's that one good. button pop over and just like set your refresh rate to your desired refresh rate uh which caps the frame rate and you get perfect frame pacing amazing plus all the uh. pre-compiled shaders that they do and like everything just work like i'm running unreal engine games in here without any sort of real shader comp stutters and i'm just like what the heck this is nuts uh, it feels great 
and be mm-hmm. and even just something like I loaded up you know a bunch of older games, but I was like playing Doom 2016 on this with that bright OLED screen. And it just it's like wow, this looks nuts. Like just to see this running on that port of what native res at that level of detail. Uh, mm. thanks to Vulcan, it has no troubles with the frame rate. It's like super, super smooth. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, even new, like I loaded up Devil May Cry 5 on this thing, and it's just that's a good per- one to do, perfect yeah. 60 FPS, and it looks stunning on this on this system. And you're like, wow, like this is you're getting a way better experience here than you could on, say, like a PS4, uh, which is really cool. And not only that, you know, I've fiddled with some emulator stuff already. Of uh, being able to drop out to the desktop, it's handled very seamlessly. I hadn't messed with that before, but yeah, I mean, it's just Linux desktop that, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever distro they're using, I forget the KDE. name, but yeah, yeah, there you go. But I installed a bunch of extra stuff on there. I installed, you know, and with Proton, I was able to put on some random like Windows games that weren't tested and they, it does work. Uh, I tested out uh, RZ on there, the, you know, the game that I'm involved with that's coming out soon. Of course, Steam is like, we don't know if this works on the Steam Deck. It does work on the Steam Deck. It works very well on the Steam Deck. That's cool. Uh, and even stuff just like more older games, like loading up something like Sonic Generations and just running that at native res and just seeing it, you know, that game's capped at 60, unfortunately, but it just runs at 60. No problem. It's like super smooth, mm-hmm. super crisp. Like everything I was testing out on here, even uh, I loaded a Batman Arkham Knight, which is still a showpiece yeah, in my eyes. Right. And I was able to put a 40 FPS cap on it, which I felt like is a pretty good middle ground. And it's between driving mm-hmm. around at 40 FPS with visuals that look that good. Uh, it's just surprising. But yeah, it really is. It's It's the user interface. The interface on this thing is, I mean, as you guys know very well, it's freaking awesome. Uh, yeah, amazing it just works super well oh another game i tried that looked honestly was mind-blowing looking is rise son of rome oh you tried that out that's cool so you know actually you can get go above 60 and it kind of mostly gets there but it wasn't perfect but i locked it at 60 and it's just like a super you know with tweaking the settings a little bit it looks better than the xbox one original and it's 60 fps and because it's a small screen the fact that they use FMV sequences no longer stands out. It was the yeah. same effect I got. I tried Max Payne 3, 90 frames per second without even a hiccup. Uh, mm. It looks freaking great on there. Uh, yeah, I'm looking through here as well. Fighting games look great. I tried Soul Calibur 6. I tried the Tekken 8 demo. Uh, and if you tweak it a bit, you can actually get that also running at a nice smooth 60 frames per second. And Tekken 8 even supports uh, 16 by 10. So it fills oh. the full OLED screen perfectly. That's good. Uh, which, again, uh, kind of unexpected. And a surprising number of games do seem to actually offer that. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's just kind of my my general impressions here is that the steam deck works darn good with a lot of games and the interface that valve has here is so good. And that's what made me think about this whole Xbox uh, windows idea of like, I think Mm. Microsoft needs to find a way to get a version of windows that is like truly like this at this level, because this really is like a console like experience, the steam deck, but it allows you to drop out to an actual desktop to do PC things. Uh, and I'm not, you know, so that just, it's awesome in that regard. When you did drop the desktop, were you using, did you use a mouse and keyboard that you hooked up to? I actually haven't done that yet. I ordered a dock now because I want to just dock, you know, one of those simple USB hub things just so I can actually Mm. more easily connect it. But I was using the little trackpad, which, uh, you know, it feels like the steam controller as you know, and it's, it, it works pretty well. I'd say it's like a laptop touchpad kind of feel. That, right. I thought that was acceptable. I was able to do file management stuff on there between that plus the touchscreen and it you know, get that going. Mm-hmm. So that was really nice. Uh, yeah, so it did. It actually does. I, I like it a lot now. And it, I said many, many episodes ago that when they would offer an OLED model, that's when I would want to upgrade and actually get a Steam Deck. And it finally and happened. So put your money where your mouth was by accident, but by still. accident, but you know, I decided <laughs> to, to stick with it and just ro- roll on out. So here uh, we go. Yeah, I see where you, sorry, I see where you're heading now with the Xbox uh, argument you were making earlier because, you know, 
if you think about what that could do with the lower level API, with yes. the level of curation that, um, that, that having like console certification provides. And the other thing, of course, about the, the OLED Steam Deck is that it kind of solves other issues. Like, you know, the battery life is actually now pretty reasonable. Yeah, Whereas exactly. The original was, was, even though the original was tons better than the Windows laptops, sorry, the Windows handhelds, it's, um, it was still kind of a bit iffy. It's like an hour and a half is, is a bit too constrictive on the AAA games. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you just get a lot more battery life on the new one. It's, it's kind of, actually viable and you know the concept of being able to produce ps4 level visuals all better in that yeah, sort better. of uh, 800p window there it's just phenomenal and i I, I am fully convinced that just 1280 by 800 is a really good screen resolution for yeah, one of these fine. because yeah. at that size the pixel density is more than high enough it looks super sharp but you don't have to drive the that many more pixels that yeah. a 1080p screen has which is why that whole 1080p deck thing that oliver is looking at I'm super skeptical about because trying to drive extra pixels, the steam deck doesn't really want to do that hardware wise. Like once you start increasing that internal res or super sample up, that's when it really starts to show its limitations. Uh, but mm -hmm. it just looks, it looks great at native res on this thing. And 16 by 10 is really good for this system uh, because well, emulation, you can play games yeah. in four by three on here and the four by three image is quite large. So something else I like, Mm -hmm. so yeah awesome. really really impressed with it it's super comfortable to use uh as you know it's bulky uh quite bulky but yeah. but very comfortable more comfortable than the switch i would say um so yeah really 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 good piece of hardware from valve here and i'm now sold on this sort of like kind of ecosystem setup thing they have going on and it really also just you know because it's just steam integrated just having the cloud save stuff like this is one of oh, the yeah, things where back. it just really actually makes a lot of sense just to be able to seamlessly jump in and out of games on your regular pc or on the steam deck like this so yeah That's awesome and based on what you're saying rich about those windows handhelds i i, I feel like they're just they, they're not there. It's just Windows on there. And that's where Microsoft could really come in with some sort of new Steam OS like fork of Windows or like a mode that you can run just for that type of hardware. Yeah. That would like, make such a difference. For in the past they've done this, like too. They you know, they they've split up like the, the, the reason why tiles ever came to existence, you know. Right. Uh, so like <sighs> I feel like this is all doable. It's just a matter of getting the which department at Microsoft is going to take take the rein on this because they seem to have like some jurisdiction issues there. I don't know what's going on, but um, yeah, uh, like the interface in Windows could easily and highly support what they would want to do with these devices. They could do it so well. Yeah, really I think should. there's a lot of complicating factors. First of all, sure, sure. Uh, the chip is small, right? It was designed for efficiency. Um, when you look at what the Windows handhelds are using, they're using laptop chips, essentially, you know, ultra, ultra low voltage for sure. You know, uh, max wattage is typically in the 28 watt range, but that is gigantically higher than what the Switch and uh, even the, uh, the Steam Deck is doing. I mean, Steam Deck is like 15 watts 15, max. Yeah. And um, I guess the question is, when you've got these chips that are much larger than the Steam Decks, you know, more compute units, more CPU cores, it needs juice to keep them powered, right? Um, so there's the there's the silicon question, and then there's the um, operating system question, which is, you know, to what extent is Windows actually a, an efficient operating system for a handheld? Big question marks over that at the moment. And then, of course, there's the utility side of things. They do seem to be trying to make things better with uh, handheld applications on Windows, right. but it's just not anywhere near the complete article that Steam OS is. Mm -hmm. There was an announcement this week that A&EO is producing a budget oriented handheld based, I mean, the headline was based on Steam OS, but it looks like it's using Hollow ISO, which is kind of like a, a derivative of Steam OS. Uh, but I will be interested to see the extent to which it operates like Steam OS and whether there are efficiency savings versus Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's that's all that, interesting stuff. That's, I'm really that's, I'm, sorry, John. Just one thing. Yeah, uh, I'm really happy when uh, stuff I've talked about months in the past the saying it's really good, and you've kind of <laughs> remained a bit skeptical. GeForce Now being the other one. Yeah, that was the other one. And then, and then months later, you actually buy into it, 
and uh, actually validate what I've been saying for months. <laughs> You're completely right. Absolutely. Again, <laughs> it does make me chuckle. I mean, uh, I, I, I always thought the Steam Deck was was a good device. It was really just the, the, yeah, screen. the screen. The screen, the screen was, was so bad on that original one. It was really ugly. And, it, and not only that, it just kind of looked awkward in that Steam Deck shell because of how large the bezels were. Like the whole thing, the I, you know what I mean, right? Like if you look at the mm -hmm. OLED versus the original, the bezels got smaller, and it feels like the screen is now better formatted for the sh for the shell of the machine. Yeah, it just you know. Also, of course, as I mentioned before, because it's OLED, when you have games that are sixteen by nine, uh, it does just black it out, so you do get slightly larger bezels, but it looks like a bezel instead of like glowing LCD backlight glowing LCD as it did backlight. before. <laughs> Yeah. Which version did you get? The 512? It's the 512. Okay, so you don't have the, uh, don't the have extra the... coating on the... No. I'd heard mm. from people that the extra coating in, in Lit Room actually makes it look less dark. Right. I'll bring mine over when I'm next. Yeah, I, I want to see. Comparison. I'm very curious to see how it compares, but yeah. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Good stuff. Well, there we All go. Right. There we go. Big surprise. That was a good surprise. John's got mm -hmm. a Steam Deck. Yes. It's a now surprise thing from John. Hee hee. <laughs> based on what's written on the docket. And uh, now we're going to move on to supporter Q&A, which is the part of the show where every week we uh, put up a post on our uh, Patreon DF supporter program and say, hey, just ask us about whatever you want, really. The ones where we can actually provide a meaningful answer um, and fit within the time constraints of this particular show, <laughs> we include. And uh, we're going to start with this one from Alfonso Suarez, who actually posted this last week, but I didn't have, uh, didn't have time to include it. Uh, something that's been itching in my head for a while was John oh versus Alex's view on VC oh. implementation. Uh, I don't think there's actually a versus here, but let's carry on. Is on there? one side, yeah. John kind of praised uh, Tears of the Kingdom for using double buffer to probably lower input latency. On the other, Alex... <laughs> banged teardown developers heads together for oh. using double buffer on xbox series x now i'm not looking for which one is the best but rather when to use them or not tearing is also an option and for alex each gpu vendor has their own implementation of vsync when would you use those over the standard C -c -c -combo, qu combo question adding fire oh. to the adding fuel to the fire I would like a little word on the true triple buffer implementation of AMD versus NVIDIA. I'm not sure what that's about. Oh. Um, surely this is a case where if your frame rate is consistent at 30 or 60 or whatever your frame rate target is, double buffer is better because, right. because you get lower latency, right? Well, also, it, Tears of the Kingdom does have drops, but right. uh, I feel like the, 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 the target frame rate being 30 already cost you some input response and like adding triple buffering on top of that tends to make the game feel extra muddy i think yeah mm -hmm. uh that extra frame does matter and yeah i mean if it was i i find that in my when i played it i didn't think it dropped like constantly or anything it was mostly pretty pretty okay outside of some busy areas but uh i think in that case it made sense but alex of course Seeing what happened in Teardown, I think yes. you, you can explain why this yeah, is good. Sixty FPS to the thirty is uh, this huge visual drop. I think thirty to twenty is not good, but it's no. a handheld. It's a handheld device. I I just have like different expectations there. And here, Same. there's no reason for it to be sixty to thirty drops, especially since any that game had such variability of load that you would just like. You could just like start uh, a chain reaction demolition, and it would just go straight down to thirty instead of maybe fifty-eight. Yeah, which you know it like, was devastating to the one twenty hertz mode as well. Yes, too. Yeah. Like that's one where it made it. It made it absolutely pointless to play in the one hundred twenty hertz <laughs> mode on Xbox Series X. There's no reason. It was basically almost never one twenty, other than when you just like look around and not interact with the world, which the game is all about interacting with the world. When so, uh, I'd say that answers part. One, uh, the the we all explain different preferences there. The part two is when would you use driver VSync versus game VSync? Uh, uh, driver VSync in those instances when uh, a game's VSync for some reason is not working correctly. I've talked about Halo Infinite on the channel a couple of times. Yep. <laughs> that game doesn't still have a working VSync implementation. Um, now, the question about true triple buffering versus not, and this is just a misnomer at this point in time. Technically, 
on NVIDIA, there's two versions of triple buffering you can enable. Um, the The default driver's VSync is triple buffered. If you just type, if at least in DX12 and DX11 it is. I don't, I haven't done a DX9 title in too long. I'm pretty sure it should be the same where you turn that on. If it drops a frame, it will not be double buffered. It will go down to 58 if we're talking about 60 hertz here, it'll do that and it'll show normal triple buffering behavior. But what it will not do is it will not render excess frames above um, above just like three back buffers there or two, sorry, two. Um, it will not render excess above that. So your GPU will be capped in performance in like actually internally. So if you look at your uh, GPU utilization, it will still be like 50%, let's say. If you, true triple buffering would actually max out your GPU and then would choose the frames that are most recently rendered to go out. The problem with that is you're reducing input latency and you can feel it. You can definitely feel the difference, but you're potentially giving a non linear interpretation of the frames out there. So you could, if you're moving the camera, you could see different animation steps uh, in terms of the time in between each of them uh, of the camera movement and or the character movement of your game. Uh, that's one of the things I talked about this in the video. And now I don't know how VSync by default works on uh, uh, AMD. I was about to say ATI because I've been playing with these all these ATI cards recently. Um, <laughs> AMD, but they both have the equivalent of fast sync, which is true triple buffering like I talked about earlier, which renders in excess of whatever your refresh rate is. And you can see it uh, if you play a game, if you turn on fast sync, you can see like it's saying like 120 FPS, even though you have a 60 hertz monitor. Uh, both NVIDIA and AMD support this. It's called fast sync on NVIDIA. I'm forgetting the word for it on AMD, but they both support this. So I don't think there is actually a discrepancy between the two of them at all anymore in the modern thing. The only thing that I've noticed uh, and I haven't tested this in a long time. The last time I tested it is when I was looking at Scanline Sync from RTSS, which I don't even think I ended up making a video for it even back in the day. But I think on AMD, if you turn on whatever Fast Sync is, it will render uh, completely arbitrary frame rates above your refresh rate. So it could go up to like 88, let's say, um, or I don't know. Some some non-divisible refresh. It can render up to non-divisible frame rates. But on NVIDIA, the last time I looked at it, it did only malt it only rendered in excess of your refresh rate in multiples. So it would do like 61, 20, 180, 240. Uh uh. And I think it would cap the GPU below that because I think they're trying to look for like actually like like I don't know how to say it, like divisible sequences of time instead of just arbitrary sequences of time. This is, getting, uh, this is getting deep. It, this is getting deep, but like these are also the timey wimey. It will be wobbly timey wimey stuff. Um, to say the least, I think they both support it these days. Both vendors support uh, true triple buffering, and you'd really only use it if I think if you're on a V-synced display and yeah. you don't have VRR. Otherwise, you're probably better off using reflex and or capping. Surely most people these days have VRR displays. I don't know. We've kind of yeah. uh, overemphasized, I think, in the past, people having newer displays uh, when they don't, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's hard to say. Yeah. Let, let's move on to the next question. This one from uh, Shallon Ogden. Hello, and my best wishes to all the handsome team members of DF. So, uh, you know, no best wishes for me. Or me. <laughs> hey, what, are, what are the specs of your Alex and Tom. <laughs> What are the best? What are the specs of your video editing rig? Furthermore, why don't you guys have beefier gaming PCs? It's your job, after all, to play video games. But I'm just curious. Have a great what? day and best wishes to you. This is kind of curious because I'm sitting here recording this on a 13900K system with 96 gigs of memory and an RTX 4080. <laughs> so you know, it's not as if I've got like a non-beefy system here. But uh, Alex, where are you at at the moment? Editing PC is 5950x, 64 gigs memory, RTX 3090. Uh, everything is running on an, an SSD these days. Uh, NVMe for first recording step and then backup steps are SATAs. 
I don't know. I think that sounds all good to me, right? Yeah, but, you know, obviously, I think maybe they're talking about the fact that you of, often talk about Ryzen 5 3600 with, like, 2070 Super, which isn't beefy. Oh, yeah. But the That's point is beefy. that most people don't have PC, beefy gaming PCs. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, that, yeah, that the mid-range spec PC. The other PC is, like, I don't think it really gets that much better, the 7800X3D um with the 4090 that's yeah it's very good i think that's fine uh the the ryzen 5 3600 now i'm waffling a bit on this because i just looked at the finals and i was like it's like oh man i i'm my 2070 super is gpu limited by the ryzen 5 3600 that's kind C of embarrassing limited. yeah cpu limited excuse yeah. me uh that i found that like a little bit like my goodness <laughs> it's kind of shocking I, usually these are like a good pairing where you wouldn't see the frame you wouldn't see like a great cpu limited scenario with this gpu usually on like appropriate settings mm. um and this was like 1440p dlss quality mode with ray tracing so it was like you know it's high you know those are gpu settings that should be intense so with that cpu i mean it, we're gonna keep it around uh for a good while i think just because it's fun to look at it in comparison to the consoles but at some point in time i, I have bought you a 3060 by the way i know i can't wait to get it <laughs> uh, i can't wait to show that off but at some point in time that's not going to be representative of the mid to low range on pc just by virtue of time passing and there's no reason for people to be still using that older zen at that point so yeah. would you say it's still a working man's pc at this point it is a working man working it's man. producing working man graphics working man uh, graphics working man <laughs> graphics oh dear uh, john Gosh. your pc is your gaming pc is yeah, your workstation I only, PC. I only have the one so oh my uh tv just responded to that <laughs> Oh yeah, it did. The stupid voice recognition. I should turn this turn. I only leave it on because I think it's funny when it picks up words. That's, that's like, it's Bading. just for lols. That's it. Yeah, um, that's good. So yeah, using twelve nine hundred K still with an MSI board and the forty ninety sixty four gigs of memory. Um, lots of NVMEs and SSDs in there now. Uh, I capture mostly though with the Ninja or the Shogun 7, depending on which device I'm capturing. So that captures two uh, SSD drives with SATA connection in ProRes. Mm -hmm. And then I just plug those into my PC uh, with little USB uh, caddies and edit mm -hmm. directly from the drives. And that works pretty well. But I, I always put the Premiere project and all the files on one of the NVMEs for good performance. But yeah, I mean, that's more than adequate, I think, for both gaming and video editing at this point. Uh, I mean, I guess it's the, the 12900K is starting to get older, but I feel like the 13 and 14 from Intel, it's not like they feel very iterative and minor. So <laughs> it's, it's not gigantically game-changing, but you no. would feel the benefit in encoding because they've stacked yeah. up the efficiency cores. And so that's true. Right. So it would probably help a little bit with encoding. That's true. I'm slowly chipping away at my uh, work process time issues where, you know, obviously got gigabit recently, finally, which makes uploads much, much faster. And, you know, time is money, right? So that actually mm -hmm. saves me... Uh, I, like an hour maybe on each video something like it saves yeah. a, a significant amount of time because of how fast i can upload and also re-ups if i if there's an error in case there's an error yeah. right but i'm still limited by encoding speed at this point uh which can be pretty slow for 4k even on this machine especially the when i have like a long 4k video which i yeah. sometimes do uh that <laughs> takes a while <laughs> takes yeah. quite a few hours i would say the gt7 overnight. versus forza one get, getting that out of premiere took like five hours and then encoding it yeah it was like an entire day of just crunching that which was uh <sighs> tedious <laughs> yeah I, th I feel like premiere is my big actually sorry adobe premiere is my big bottleneck it's the export because pc yep. videos have a lot my pc videos have a lot of three-way four-way uh comparisons and uh as well as our uh you know proprietary fps tools um graphs that are exporting the graphs are slow but then three and four ways are also very slow in premiere and i have no idea why i, I still don't know why they should they feel wait, like wait. they shouldn't be slow the, oh the graphs three or yeah. 
three or four no no three three or four way comparisons oh like no that, three, well, three video depend, streams at 4k depends on what type of video you're using on prores it's totally fast well yeah that's the thing is I, I don't have prores no well i'm just access saying, yeah there, there are codecs you can capture in the, i think magic yuv is like that yeah, so I would love to use Magic the file YUV. Size is giant. I know the file size is bigger are than so, ProRes, but yeah, it's yeah, like so. I, I I have to when I do 4K 120 capture, which the finals, all that video, like so in that video, I used a lot of slow mo shots of the explosions or just right. even the general gameplay. All that's 4K 120 being run at half speed, uh, and I play I did all the B roll in that video at 4K 120, which was really fun, but. <laughs> uh, Magic yeah. YUV 420 okay, is yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. 2.5 yeah, times. This, it's so big. It's, it is big. It's, it's so big. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Let's move on to the next question. This one from Dakvac. And I might be wrong here. Was? I, think, I think Dakvac might well be the guy who uh, created this lovely bespoke t shirt that I'm wearing. Oh, oh that's so great. Which we should probably roll out as some sort of merch yeah. offering. It's bomb. Yeah, that's that is a it's, it's actually falling. bespoke right now. It is bespoke indeed. Mm. Anyway, uh, hello DF exclamation point. Do you think that any TV manufacturers will ever implement retro filters as an option in game mode, or at the very least, nearest neighbor scaling? Almost all recent retro game collections include some sort of CRT filter, so it seems like the option is popular enough. Is it only a matter of time before some company? implements a Kmart version of a retro tink into their <laughs> displays with the right uh, marketing feels like it could be a big win uh, interesting point right John but I think fundamentally the retro tink is kind of like a very niche it's that's product. the thing it's very very niche and I think the thing about it the CRT filters for instance and the way that works in the tink it's actually pretty complex right there's a lot of granularity there and uh, it puts a lot of onus on the user i mean yes you can provide pre-made profiles to a degree but then you're getting to the point to for it to really work you've got to provide profiles for every different type of system uh including different resolution like it's right. it's crazy what you have to do there so i don't think we're going to see anything like that in a display that's just beyond what they would want to do nearest neighbor scaling though gosh i don't got understand why this is there was a panasonic there was some yeah. there was a couple of years of Panasonic that had nearest neighbor scaling in there and I think it I don't know if it's still there or not actually in the newer models but nobody else is doing this they don't offer it and I get it because most displays are considering video and also you could send an uneven image in and then you'd end up with weird scaling artifacts like there's reasons why you wouldn't necessarily want to expose that but I feel like there should be an option where it's like if you're receiving X kind of like either 720 or 1080, just do call it like perfect pixel scale or something like that. Just something to make it like extra Crisp. sharp, just and it make it only available in game mode, put in the game optimizer that LG has or whatever equivalent in the other brands. But I feel like that should be something they could do because nearest neighbor scaling is the least expensive type of scaling anyway there's no computational issue here it's just they don't <laughs> provide the darn option and with yeah, this rise yeah. at, at ces you see them all talking about ai upscaling and we're putting more ai in our tv it's like they're looking at ways to artificially boost the image when we actually want the opposite we just want the most raw you can get and i really wish i i don't know we don't know any people with these companies. We're not influential enough with these big companies to make any difference. I don't know if there's anybody out there that can, but I want somebody to go in there and like understand like this would be easy to add and it would be a huge deal for anyone playing video games, basically. I would love to collaborate with a display manufacturer. I mean, preferably LG or Samsung or whatever, who mm -hmm. um, basically there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here that, that they could actually um, sort out. I mean... Obviously, nearest neighbor scaling is a great start. Secondly, um, well, you know, the uh, LG stuff has the, is it the game optimizer or the, you know, it's yeah, got a frame rate exactly. counter. These frame rate counters don't support low frame rate compensation. So they're off, you know, basically inaccurate a lot of the time. I mean, there's, there, there are ways and means to actually produce accurate frame rate calculations, which, you know, it's yeah. not difficult. They just need it to know what's going on there. I'm wondering, like, I I know Blurbusters has the the verified logos and Blurbusters approved approved yeah. for videos, display processes approved for displays themselves, and then verified 
and like something like that, some sort of program, either from us or integrated with somebody else, just working with somebody in that space to get some of these features in there, it would be so beneficial. And I think mm -hmm. uh, it's just, we don't know those people basically. Well, you <laughs> so know, maybe uh, the guy from Blurbusters does. I'll, I should, talk, Blurb, yeah. I should talk, yeah. talk to Mark at some time and see if he has any insight into this because when, you know, this is a different type of blur, but it's blur all the same, right? <laughs> Upscale blur versus right. motion blur, but still, uh, yeah, that would, that would be. I cool. mean, we've tried to talk to Microsoft about this, and they do have sway with the display manufacturers. They, they can do seem, it in Windows if they, they didn't wanted. seem to really get it or why it was important when when i bring this up with people like that. Like, there's this there's this mystery of like, why would you want that? It's just raw pixels. Uh, right. You even see this in like retro compilations sometimes where they just don't, it feels like they're allergic to this idea of raw pixels, but sometimes that's what you want. Like, don't mess with the image. Just give us those raw crisp pixels. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It should be possible and it would be a great option to provide, especially if you're already doing like these gaming oriented UIs in the TVs already, right? Just do, yeah. this, do add it there. So, right. so one thing I thought about really quickly is I was just looking at it. Do you know about those new um, uh, dual mode monitors that are going to be coming out that switch the hertz and yep. resolution? I think those are going to be integer scaling, though. Really? And they're, they're, they're part of the, the, the latest version of Adaptive Sync announced support for them. Um, because if, if it's going to be taking like a monitor that's 4K 240 and then turning it into a 1080p 480 hertz monitor at that point, um, if that was bilinear if it was just like bilinear blurring that up to 4k it wouldn't make any sense it, bad. it would look bad and if it's part of the standard for adaptive sync i mean it's like it could even exist on a hardware level it doesn't even require os support at that point right right so i don't know i feel like there's, there's definitely leeway in here it's just a matter that's, of getting your foot in the door it's funny alex that's used to be how old laptop displays worked uh, it mm -hmm. wasn't good at the time because the resolutions were too low. But if you bought, like, say, a mid-90s 800 by 600 screen laptop and you would scale lower resolutions and you filled the screen, those were not powerful enough to actually filter the image. So it would just be mm -hmm. a raw nearest scale. So you would get those sharp pixels, but 640 to 800 640 to 800 by 600 it's not an even scale so it looks it actually looked bad you want to make sure that it's actually an even scale for this to be effective but you know right it was part of those computers in the past <sighs> so it goes mm, okay i'm wondering john just as a final thing on this topic whether there is some kind of basic retro tink um filter set that mike might like to sort of set up in some sort of licensing arrangement that would mm. actually wow that's that is an interesting idea uh to sort of like a retro tink light like feature i, I yeah. don't i don't know what that would entail or how much of a difference that would who would be interested in that but yeah i would love <laughs> that kind of thing to exist me uh you yeah because i mean you know his product is is very very niche still and it's selling very well considering that niche but still mm -hmm. absolutely uh, but man thinking of displays and stuff what is it on the df clips channel you put up one of those the video on when lcd has arrived did you notice that they were worse than crts it was either that or one of these other videos and one of the comments that i just saw pop up was like maybe someday someone will make it display <laughs> we'll make a display that John Lindemann actually likes or whatever, or like one that actually like suits your needs. And I'm thinking about that still. Cause I'm like, mm, there is no display that actually Perfect suits all display. of my, all, all of my needs. Yeah. I am enjoying uh DF clips, uh, getting <laughs> substantial amounts of views on extremely niche topics that kind of bother us <laughs> and seem to bother other people. And it's like, you know, these videos are doing better views than a lot of the mainstream stuff that we put on there funny. which is quite amusing mm -hmm. um, let's move on to the next top uh, the next question rather this one from musha 68k uh, is anyone in the is anyone in the know why dynamic resolution is rarely used in pc games as far as i know it's one of the secret weapons of switch games punching above their weight quote unquote couldn't <laughs> dynamic resolutions be promising both in quote unquote vanilla form but especially so in combination with state-of-the-art upscaling algorithms 
Yeah, actually, um, Cyberpunk does um, DRS with uh, FSR, but weirdly not DLSS. Anyway. Yeah, it's a missed um, opportunity. I wonder if Valve could be working on something in that regard for SteamOS uh, slash DEX performance level settings for FSR, TSR, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the reasons, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure you've got a lot more to say about it, is mm. that um, uh, memory management on consoles is a lot more fine-grained and granular. Developers have a lot more control, and it's actually quite a useful thing to have for uh, dynamic resolution scaling. Yeah, memory, also having a good understanding of what is touching the GPU and what isn't. Um there was a good thread by, I may be wrong, Chris Wright? Maybe I'm wrong, Chris Wright? I'm for, sorry, I'm forgetting names. Uh, worked on Gears 5, works at the Coalition, talking about uh, getting DRS to work on PC. And I, if I recall, uh, Chris wrote how they had at the end of the project track because that game supports dynamic resolution scaling on pc but they had to track down a bug that was occurring on test machines because microsoft outlook like a default install program on windows was occasionally like just grabbing into gpu and taking away gpu time which was causing probably the res to bottom out or for or for the res to change when it shouldn't be arguably um and so there, there, that's one thing that is just like the resource management on PC is less fixed and less stable, but therefore you usually tend to have a lot more of it. Like you have a lot more memory, you have a lot more GPU and CPU power usually than you have on a console in a higher end spec kit. And so these kind of things and actually being able to have like precise GPU timing for the frame that's currently being built is not always a given. Uh, so uh, that that leads to it being harder to implement on PC, but that doesn't mean it's not implemented. It's pro it's I've seen it implemented incredibly well. We've talked about that in the past for a lot of games where it's implemented very well. well I've also seen awful implementation. <laughs> I remember the one. My favorite one is uh, the game I like. Um, it's Rage Two. But I remember that one, whenever you would jump, it would adjust the DRS. And I, like, I kept jumping up and down and the DRS went down to like zero, like like pixel pixels. Um, so yeah, so it is harder to do. Um, it's not just Switch games though. It's like, it's a big benefit on consoles as well too. Uh, but one of the things that's kind of a counteract against DRS is VRR displays uh, to a little degree. like. On console, you have to worry about getting like a flat 60 hertz because you can't assume everyone has yeah. a VRR display. Mm -hmm. On PC, it's starting to become so common that almost everyone has it. And what's worse, being at like 52 FPS or and having really good image quality or being at 60 FPS, but then having noticeably degraded visual, visual quality. And I think a lot of people with VRR displays would say, just drop a few frames. They're, they're invisible anyways with vr so i as part it was in my 13 uh tenets of pc good parts whatever video uh, uh please have drs on pc but i can't just expect it always even though i really want it yeah i think you know obviously with drs you need a frame rate limit to be targeting you know to adjust right. the resolution and i do think there is good reasons to have like you know arbitrary refresh rate or sorry or game update limits um, and to use DRS because you do, you know, nothing can beat a really truly consistent experience. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, you can obviously, I mean, Cyberpunk is an interesting one. You And I think uh, going back to like the, the gold standard Titanfall 2, you know, you define the upper and lower bounds and the frame rate target that you want, and then it should just work. So uh, good. I think it's an extra tool in the toolbox and PC is all about that, right? Just, just my thoughts. Um, let's move on to the next question. This one from some guy person. Uh, regarding the super GPUs, uh, I think he's referred to the RTX 40 C series refresh. I think a great perspective to ha have when reviewing the products is to find the answer to, quote unquote, what screen is this for? Obviously, you'll get better performance if you pay more money, but how much do you really need to spend to have a good time 
with PS5 Series X quality graphics on 1080p, 1440p or 4K monitors, assuming you're GPU limited. Just looking at a bunch of charts provided by other outlets makes it seem like the only GPU to get if you have a 4K monitor is an RTX 4090, but I know that's not true. Running these GPUs at the quote unquote optimized settings on a per game basis should make for some very interesting results that would effectively help the end user to reduce their GPU budget at a time when the price of these things is ever increasing. Nvidia and AMD know that just running benchmarks at native 4K with ultra settings is ultimately a disservice to their own GPU performance and use it as a way to upsell the con the customer into buying a better GPU. Alex has shown you can easily get 30 to 40% more performance with some smart cutbacks to settings. That's the difference between a 400 GPU and an $800 GPU if you're right. just going off raw GPU performance increases. Uh, interesting point this, Alex, which is, you know, I don't think you... I've, I've sort of had issues with this in the past where, you know, NVIDIA or AMD would say, hey, this, this GPU is designed for 1440p gaming. Right. And we're seeing it now actually with the 4070 Super, which is, you know, basically as fast as, you know, if the benchmarks are to be relieved, it's kind of almost as good as a 4070 Ti, which in turn is almost as good as a 3090, which which we both know can produce fantastic results on a 4K screen. I think it is about optimized settings. It is about um, accepting that upscaling is now part of the mix. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a curious one. I mean, you know, I've played um, stuff like, you know, Marvel Spider-Man at 4K with DLSS performance mode on a 3060, and it was a perfectly great experience. 60 frames per second, optimized settings. It is it is a bit weird to have this labeling. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the... I, I get what the person's saying, right? Because, like, if you're on a 1440p screen and... That's why those benchmarks exist that show the card working at different resolutions. I think it's to give people like a generic idea of what it's like, uh, but it's also then just doing them blindly, the benchmarks at ultra, which is not very, it's not actually a realistic window. It's just, that's just to create a baseline to compare to other things, but not a way people actually will use the card. So I think that's what the, the person's getting at here. And like the real way you use a card is at a fixed res monitor and you want to have the game run at or close to your refresh rate or at least 60 minimum 60 i think for some people and then if you'd produce a review like that you'd have a very different understanding of a card and in fact i think with all the cards that are coming out right now the supers you'd say they're all incredible at that point in time because you'd be using optimized settings you'd be using dlss and you realize like man i can get like hfr experiences in every single game out there with ray tracing like that's yeah. crazy so you'd realize that these gpus are incredibly powerful and uh then the review would just be glowing uh <laughs> at that point in time but yeah i agree exactly what they're saying it, it's it's a hard thing to do because you when you look at making one of these gpu reviews you still want to give a sense of what the rest of the market is but a, maybe a real gpu review is actually saying like okay what can we actually do with this card to produce good experiences yeah, and then that's a different thing entirely. Yeah, I mean, I I sort of take issue with the uh, 4K Ultra benchmarks that come out, which basically show nothing being playable on anything other than a 4090, which is kind of weird because you just wouldn't be using native 4K to begin with, because the upscaling solutions are so good these days, and you probably wouldn't be using Ultra because the difference between Ultra and High is often non-existent or very difficult to pick up by the human eye. So, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, how are you helping the audience with that particular type of coverage? It's a bit really kind of weird, right? Mm -hmm. um, anything to add to that one, John? No, I mean, his point about the benchmarks and, and how they kind of make it seem like you maybe need more hardware than you might actually need to run. Uh, obviously getting that Steam Deck made me think more about that when I was surprised to see even something as lightweight as that hardware is able to provide pretty good experiences in games you might not expect. Yeah. And mm. so, like, you know, you scale up more with an actual PC and a mid-range graphics card, and I think you can achieve a lot. Yeah, so, absolutely. Right. I mean, it is about basically, um, you know, the, the power differentials between the cards, but I don't think you can pigeonhole any card as specific to a... a a certain display type 
No. Um, I can see why NVIDIA would maybe say, okay, 4060 is for 1080p, because they can look at their telemetry and see that the vast majority of like 2060 and 3060 owners are still on a 1080p screen, right? That mm. kind of makes sense, but that doesn't preclude the um, these cards from being run on 1440p screens where yeah, actually exactly. they tend to perform quite well um, as long as there aren't any VR yeah. limitations. Agreed. Um, let's move on to the final question from uh, Octolima. Uh, I'm a bit late, but happy New Year's DF exclamation point. I was wondering if you guys yeah. could share what games you're anticipating this year, as well as what videos you're most excited to create, time permitting. I always enjoy it when Alex goes in depth in his tech focus videos. Any more of those on the cards? I think we talked about our g- games that we're excited about in mm. the last direct. I think we're pretty clear about that. But um, this concept of what videos we'd like to create in 2024, I do find quite an interesting topic. Uh, actually, it talks about Alex. So I'm going to go to you first, John. I mean, what stuff would you like to do in the, the year of our laws 2024? Well, I do I have some cool DF retros that I want to make. Obviously, I don't want to spoil what they are yet, just in case it doesn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but uh yeah, yeah that, I, that's a weird thing isn't it because we we often promise videos and never have the time to do them and it sh- don't tell the I, audience i that. don't like to do that and that's <laughs> yeah. you know i i kind of <laughs> almost fell in that with the forza versus gt thing which i'm glad i did in the end but you know i might have been able to weasel out of it if i hadn't promised it but mm. uh which again glad i did not because it was a cool video to make but uh yeah more retro stuff of course um that's kind of always big on the plan on my plans is just finding ways that I can get the time to make those types of videos that I enjoy finding new topics, uh, that I've not covered before necessarily. That's, that's exciting. I would like to, I wish there was a way to do more. Um, I want to go harder on looking at displays in the future. Uh, obviously, you know, just like, I, I wish there was a way to get my hands on something for testing you know, and then like a place to go that actually has this stuff available. I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff happening in that space, but uh, which would be fun to look at in more detail. I was thinking about trying to do, I want to make sure people have been asking t- to comment more on HDR implementations in games, which is something I've been thinking about adding in. I don't know if I can provide as meaningful analysis because they don't necessarily have the tools to do so, but at least mm-hmm. sharing thoughts on how HDR is implemented. Uh, because I, I do find weirdly enough that HDR in games has kind of gotten worse. It almost feels that way to some degree, you know, where when I look at all the games that have the best HDR, they're all older at this point. Yeah. So uh, I want, I kind of want to make a priority out of HDR again, just so, just to make sure that people understand it is still valuable and there's more HDR mm-hmm. displays sold every day. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond that, I would like to hopefully do more stuff with you guys. Uh, I have some videos I want to make based on stuff I did in Japan last year that I haven't had time mm-hmm. to do yet. Uh, I have some cool film footage and interview stuff and some neat B roll showing behind the scenes kind of things that I would like to integrate into some kind of a video, stuff like that. Okay, Alex, this uh, Octolima here is interested in tech focus. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think the one uh, tech focus video that I see talked about uh, in comments and the one that I've mentioned I wanted to do in the past is like the VRR is not a savior video. Uh, It wouldn't be very long though. Like tech focus videos tend to be a little bit longer. This one is actually a little bit simple. And it's uh, the thing about it is it wouldn't it doesn't uh, it wouldn't it couldn't really be shown on YouTube. It would be a lot of discussing and talking about why um, because I can't show VRR on YouTube. <laughs> just can't. So that's the challenge we're uh, gonna have to. Uh, address yeah, just you just yeah like there's yeah there's some way we get around that in the future. Um, I want to do that. Uh, I would love to do that this year at some point. And that one's a shorter video because I could just write that out almost like in a day. And it's a matter of just getting myself in front of the camera to talk about it at that point in time. Uh, I, d- I did talk how I really want to do... Uh, this would probably fall under actually the DF Retro Moniker at that point in time, but the PhysX Greatest Hits. I feel like that's that's like a, a video that should be made. Uh because there's so much to be said there about GPU physics, the entire history of it, why it's different than the 
other things that you see nowadays. Uh, and I think we have uh, a great relationship with NVIDIA that we could even get people who worked on PhysX to probably talk about it. Or I could contact them through LinkedIn, et cetera, get some really good views on that direct from the source. Um, and I think that would be an amazing video. Uh, that would have a longer production time, though, because like, like John knows, when you capture anything that is just like a generic ta- theme, like physics like okay well who's gonna go back and record all the games oh that's me yeah that's a long, <laughs> uh, oh long no yep. that's so many games mm. uh, is what you think so that that's a longer video not including the scripting that's a long that's a long getting those exact video. shots that you want to use in a video too like the amount of work it takes just to like sometimes you're like oh i just want to show this this five second clip of some very specific thing yeah uh, that can mean hours of time yeah it's like yeah it's like hours into a game maybe Already, oh like, gosh so yeah that's yeah. tough yeah. I, yeah i remember when for doing the global illumination tech focus video i wanted to show off oh god remember me and i was like okay where do i find parallax aligned cube maps in this game and it took like two hours into the story to even find them it's like geez. you didn't remember where they were that's, the game came out outrageous. in 2013 how embarrassing <laughs> yeah. uh, i couldn't remember yeah but th- those are two videos i really want to do this year and there's more but like right now i think that's enough Ooh. to say yeah i mean i'm not thinking about individual projects but i do want to just completely revamp a, a pc gpu reviews uh we've talked about this in the past um i think the way people are using their gpus isn't the way that's being reflected in reviews uh which is you know kind of almost what uh, was being discussed earlier by some guy person there. Um, Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I'd like to do. I think we need to crack the whole VRR in YouTube scenario uh, and proper VRR measurement uh, because I'm not happy with the way that's working at the moment, but it's of crucial importance because I think certainly with our audience, a lot of people do have VRR displays now. And I think you sort of raised it in Prince of Persia quite well, John, where in the 120 hertz mode series x is runs faster than playstation but in the real world you're talking about a one millisecond per frame difference on frame time and it's basically you know you can't really see it in a vr you uh, can't see it at all you know we've got to kind of move with the times there um i'd like to revamp our whole pipeline on performance analysis in terms of um um getting the data quickly and uh, mm-hmm. just optimizing workflows. Uh, so it's not really sort of video related, but definitely related to what we're doing here at, at Digital your, Foundry. Your new ideas for benchmarking GPUs, man, it's, it's revolutionary. This, like the drop test, especially, like I've never yeah, seen anything like it. Was, the idea was... of like, right, like bringing it up to the top of that, that one building near your house and just whichever <laughs> GPU hits just the ground first it. gets there the fastest it's game That's, changing right like nobody, nobody's yeah. done this not even Linus so no. I, I think we're, we're onto something I'm even upscaling my house for increased yeah. drop distances exactly <laughs> upscaling my house yeah <laughs> Oh, that's good, John. Oh, yeah, it's, it's very good. I honestly thought you were talking about the frame drop stuff in the. I know. I was like, I was like, that's amazing. There, but uh, you've you've ta- you've evolved the concept to the next level. Actual <laughs> physical, the actual physical next drops. level. Exactly. <laughs> that could be part of your uh, display mm. testing, John. You know, form oh, yeah. all of these relationships with display manufacturers and then drop their displays off Do the, the drop building. <laughs> <laughs> like, does it blend digital foundry almost? It's yes. Bad. Does it fly? <laughs> you could be, PlayStation uh, 5. Could be presented by Clarence uh, Let's Let's see how yeah, bendable okay. this OLED really is. Funk. <laughs> Okie dokie, that's the end of that particular question, and therefore the end of the show. So please do whatever, like, subscribe, share if you enjoyed it, ring the bell for whatever the notifications may or may, may not appear on your phone or whatever browser mm, screen. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. Browser screen. <laughs> DF supporter program, join us, get involved, join our amazing community, get early access to DF Direct Weekly every single week. Lots of privileges, exclusives, uh, early access, that sort of thing. Uh, but that's all from us for this week. We'll see you next week.